A few weeks ago, I published a short about a local bike route in Vancouver that gets clogged with car traffic. Inevitably, there was an endless stream of comments calling for cyclists to pay their fair share if they want proper bike lanes, often citing all the cost a car owner incurs, which contribute to paying for our city streets. So, should cyclists pay taxes to cover the cost of the lanes they desperately call for? Yes, they should, but thankfully, they already do. My name is Nick, and mini movers are my thing. Subscribe for regular content. And to preface this, I'd like to mention that I own a car, as do most people who cycle, but for the purposes of this video, we'll put that aside. Also, while I am mostly talking about Vancouver, Canada, this is generally the same in much of North America. So with that out of the way, it's true. Cyclists already pay a tax for the surfaces they ride on. Why this might be a surprise to some stems from a fundamental misunderstanding of how our streets are funded. Like many commented, there is a belief that the taxes associated with car ownership, like fuel, licensing, insurance, vehicle purchase, and maintenance are the source for which we can build and maintain our streets, including the construction of bike lanes. Which is partly true. Some taxes associated with car ownership help fund our streets. However, as Patrick Johnson pointed out in his article, Who Pays for Roads, he estimated that of all the taxes an average driver in BC pays a year, just $50 of that makes its way into the streets. The rest going to different things like carbon tax fund and funding provincial highways, for which the gas taxes also don't fully cover. And even if all the taxes associated with car ownership went to covering the cost of street maintenance, it still would fall short by 40%. Which brings us to the reality that our streets and bike lanes are largely funded by property and sales taxes, something we all contribute to. Consider the same person in alternate realities. Let's call him Ted, living the same life, paying property taxes for the same home, but choosing a different form of transportation. One chooses a car and the other a bicycle. Driver Ted spends around $10,000 a year on his transportation, and a percentage of that spending will be taxes. A portion of those taxes will make it back to his local transportation budget. Meanwhile, Cyclist Ted only spends around $300 a year for his transportation, leaving him with a pretty nice bonus of $9,700 a year. He may decide to save some of that money, but it's likely he'll spend much of it. And studies show shoppers who arrive by bicycle or foot spend more money per month than those who arrived by car, which is not only generating those tax dollars that would have otherwise come from car expenses, but is also more money invested locally rather than lining the pockets of oil execs or billionaires in Texas. In the end, Cyclist Ted is more likely to be a bigger local tax generator than Driver Ted. So, everyone pays for city streets, but what really separates Driver Ted from Cyclist Ted are the impositions they pose on local infrastructure and their fellow man. Starting with the damage to roads. While it's true that trucking does the bulk of the damage, a 9-ton truck does 400 times more damage than a 4,000-pound car, keep in mind that it would take over 16,000 kilometers on a bike to reach the level of a single kilometer in an average car, which should be pointed out are bulking up every year. All of this to say the cost to build and maintain cycling infrastructure is far less than the same distance of roads for cars, requiring less space, less material, and simply do not need to be as robust, with the cost of roadways anywhere from 5 to 300 times the cost of bike lanes per kilometer, like in Portland where $60 million for 300 miles of bikeways would have been equivalent to one single mile of a four-lane urban freeway. And the lanes being relatively cheap are one of the many ways that cycling is a boon for a community. A cost-benefit analysis from Copenhagen revealed that the externalities of driving a car for one kilometer costs society 89 cents, but cycling the same distance benefits society by 26 cents. And this comes from a combination of things like congestion, collisions, noise pollution, health benefits, infrastructure costs, air pollution, and the benefits cycling has on business. And if we were to properly integrate externalities of driving into a gas tax, for example, it would cost about $1.05 a liter for the average BC resident, or $1,123 a year. Currently, Vancouver drivers pay the highest gas tax in North America at 78 cents a liter, so even if the entirety was earmarked for covering the externalities it imposes, it still wouldn't be enough. And this is the most optimistic example. Many states in the U.S. fall way short, like the average Mississippi driver imposing a cost of $2,300 while they currently pay $140 a year with a gas tax of just six cents a liter. And this is not even mentioning electric cars who don't pay gas taxes and still impose many of the externalities of ice-powered cars. Finally, some will point out that we all need roads even if we never drive on them. For emergency vehicles, some public transit, and trucking goods. And this is not even getting to the argument for trains when it comes to freight. 
It's true, work in freight trucks, buses, as well as emergency vehicles are beneficial for everyone when they use the roads. But it ignores the fact that the overwhelming majority of vehicles we see on our roads are cars occupied by just one person. Even before getting into the cost that storing all these vehicles pose in society, a person driving a car occupies significantly more space on the road compared to someone using a bus or a bicycle. Often adding to congestion, while individuals who walk, cycle, or use public transit actually help free up road space, indirectly saving time for other road users, including those operating essential vehicles, and yes, even people who drive. So, judging by how often I see comments calling for cyclists to pay their fair share, it bears repeating over and over and over. Not only do people who cycle pay their fair share for the bike lanes they want, they give back and help subsidize people who choose to drive. So every time you drive, every time you park your car for free, every time you wait in a drive through lineup to get a cup of coffee, the space you take up in the community was bought and paid for by everyone. And at the end of the day, the more someone uses the streets and the bigger the vehicle they choose to do it in, the more likely they aren't paying their, quote, fair share. So the next time you think about calling for entitled cyclists to pay their fair share, think about who are actually the entitled that need to shut the f*** up. And with that, my name is Nick. Thanks for watching.